Well, thank you for joining us for this edition of our Friday Faith Night series. I suppose if you look back on the calendar, it has been just about a year since we began experiencing some of the disruptions from the COVID-19 virus. It has affected some of our assemblies, our class offerings. It has certainly affected getting haircuts and other things that were just a normal part of our routine. But in the midst of all of those disruptions, I truly believe there have been some blessings, oftentimes that we've not appreciated enough. We've had this opportunity on Friday evenings that we had never had before. To be able to spend 30 minutes at that unusual time of 7 o'clock on a busy Friday evening to try to reestablish faith, to, to build the, the foundations of our faith into a more solid foundation. And I thank the elders for the opportunity of being able to do this. And I thank you who have been so faithful, so regular, so supportive in the things that we've been doing with Friday Faith Night. I know there are many people who are still deeply affected by the virus. There are individuals I know who are battling it currently, who are hospitalized, who are sick at home. Uh, we want to ask God's blessing on their recovery. There are others who still haven't gotten back to work. Other individuals who have found new stress points in their life, even their spiritual lives, that they're struggling with how to get past that hurdle. We want to remember them too. So as we start our time together this evening, I'd like for you to stop what you're doing. Focus with me for just a moment as we pray. Father, we recognize that life is filled with all kinds of adversities and hurdles. The longer that we live, the more aware we are of, of where they come from. And hopefully the longer we live, Father, the, the better we're able to handle those because we know you better and our relationship with you is better, that our trust in Scripture is stronger. And yet tonight as we pray, we want to especially ask your blessing on folks we know who are struggling related to the virus. Father, we know individuals who are sick, some very sick, seriously ill with it. We pray for your blessing and their healing. Father, their jobs and businesses that are still shuttered or operating at 50%. We pray that those can resume their business and jobs can be restored and incomes can be replaced. Father, for those who are struggling, especially with their faith, who because they haven't had the access to meeting in person, being with people, have allowed their commitment, their faith, to fade. Father, we pray that not only this class, but all that we're going to be doing in the weeks ahead will help them reboot that faith and restore that relationship. We're just thankful you listen to us. You know our hearts. You know our struggles. And we're thankful tonight that as a group in this session, we can pray together and ask for your blessing through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, we've been looking for the last few weeks at the life of Saul of Tarsus, who we come to know better as the Apostle Paul. We began looking at his background, his roots, his genealogy, his Jewish heritage. Last week, we talked about his conversion, one of the most famous stories out of the book of Acts, that bright light that shines down on the, the road just outside of the city limits to this Syrian town of Damascus. And he is confronted with Jesus, who says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he is told to go into the city. Ananias, uh, a disciple there in Damascus, comes and knocks on his door, introduces him to the full gospel of Jesus Christ. He's baptized for the remission of his sins. Tonight, we want to pick that story up beyond his conversion and the initial transformation that we saw last week. And think about what it was that he did in his early ministry and the events that were the first things that were a part of his new life in Christ. I think back in my life to my early ministry. I think about growing up in Springfield, Tennessee at the Main Street Congregation and opportunities they gave me to, to teach classes or to uh, speak in a devotional or even a sermon here and there. I think about two years while I was in college that I drove out to Adams, Tennessee and preached for them on Sunday morning and Sunday night and worked with vacation Bible schools during the summer. And uh, then those first jobs that were full-time in Indiana and Cloverdale and Park Avenue. And then for what's been 
28 years here in Old Hickory. That, that's my long-term ministry, but I can't help but remember how influential, how life-changing those times that I spent at Springfield and Adams were. They were my first venture where people trusted me, in a sense, with their spiritual lives. And the leadership that came from key men, elders in the church, were extremely important to my ministry. And so I identify as I look back at the first things that happens in Saul's life after his conversion as it relates to his ministry, because I see similarities in that. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 9, if you want to have your Bibles open and follow along as, as I look at a particular set of texts, and we'll highlight some of the events that take place during the first decade or so of Saul's ministry. The first of these picks up immediately after his baptism. It's in Acts chapter 19. We begin actually right in the middle of verse 19. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Now, that is diametrically opposed to what his message had been, wasn't it? He had challenged Jesus as the Messiah. He had persecuted those who embraced Jesus as the Messiah. And now he's standing in the synagogue there in Damascus, not seeking to arrest those who called on the name of Jesus, but he confirmed the same message that they had, that he is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed. And they were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength, confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, his proof would have come from those messianic prophecies that had been in, in Micah and Isaiah, Jeremiah, and other places. He, as a skilled student of the law, had all the pieces of what the gospel message was and the evidences for the deity of Jesus. He had just looked through a false premise, the falseness of Christ. And now that he had encountered Christ and experienced the cleansing of his sin through the blood of Christ, all of those pieces now become the pieces of evidences to confirm Christ. The text is going to continue with this in verse 23, that there's going to be a plot that's made against him, and he's going to have to escape the city. We do know of one other particular text. It's in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 17, as Paul relives there some of the early days of his ministry. He said, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Well, the assumption is that that Arabian ministry, which would have been to the east and the southeast of Damascus, was the territory that he went when things in Damascus got just a little bit tight, a little bit hot, and then he comes back to Damascus, and then we find this situation. The Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night, and they led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. You know, there are a lot of great escapes that are recorded for us in the course of Scripture. You, you have individuals who uh, escaped things uh, like Samson when he was bound, when he was uh, not telling the full truth to Delilah, and then he would escape whatever they had bound him with, and, and he would be free. Uh, th there were individuals who, who, like Peter and the apostles, were arrested and put in prison, but they miraculously escaped. Daniel from the lion's den. God has done a lot of delivering of people who were in the midst of difficulties. And here the disciples, they... They know that if Saul stays much longer, sooner or later, these Jewish officials there in Damascus are not going to be able to cir circumvent the, the civil authorities, and they're going to take him, they're going to kill him. And so they lower him over a wall, and he escapes. Well, that takes us to the next section of his ministry. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. 
But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. I am so thankful for an individual by the name of Barnabas. We've met him the first time back in Acts chapter 4, as he was an individual who was called the son of encouragement. He was an individual who had some lands. He sold them and brought that money, gave it to the apostles so that it could be distributed to saints who were struggling with, with the needs of life. But I especially like that phrase there, that he was the son of encouragement. And that's what he is here to Saul, isn't he? Saul arrives in Jerusalem for the first time after he had been sent out, and he's not the same man that he was, but nobody knows that for sure. They've heard, maybe, rumors of what had taken place in Damascus. But it's something else. Remember how anxious Ananias was when he got the message from God to go talk to him? And he says, don't you know, Lord, what this man is doing to your church? And he says, yes, I know what he has been doing, but I know what it is he's going to be doing. And now Barnabas is the conduit to introduce this new Christian to the fellowship of God's people in Jerusalem. Now there's going to continue to be a plot that's formed against him. It says that he was talking and arguing with Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. When the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea, and they sent him away to Tarsus. Now, if that sounds just a little bit familiar, you'll, you'll know that is true, because that was his hometown, wasn't it? He was from Cilicia, born in this Roman city of Tarsus, and now things were dangerous in Damascus. He goes to Jerusalem. Things are dangerous in Jerusalem. So they take him to the port city of Caesarea and they send him back off north to his hometown in Tarsus. And he is there going to continue preaching. he continue his ministry. It's just going to be in a little different, safer context for him for a time until we meet his next opportunity of local work. Well, after some time has passed, we're introduced to a city called Antioch. Now, there's going to be an Antioch that is mentioned in the first missionary journey, but this is Antioch of Syria. It is one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire. In fact, likely in the first century, around the time of Saul and Paul here, it was the third largest city in the empire. You had cities like Rome and Alexandria, who were obviously the prominent cities within the empire, but Antioch of Syria was likely the third. It was a, a town of about 500,000 people, half a million people living in it. It was the capital of Syria. It, it had a series of aqueducts in order to move water throughout the city, a series of baths. It, it had lamp-lighted buildings, even in the first century, amphitheaters. It had running water. It had a paved marble street that ran for four miles. In fact, some had styled the city Antioch the Beautiful. Others called it the Queen of the East. It was a remarkable city. And we've been introduced to the storyline in Acts with these, this information that it became one of the first integrated congregations or cities that we read about in Scripture. Those who had been persecuted even back in the time of Saul, the text tells us, had gone everywhere preaching the word in Acts chapter 8, but to the Jews uh, in, in their synagogues. But then it mentions in particular that there were some who were from Cyrene and some from the, the island of Cyprus who had come to this town of Antioch, which was, a, again, a very cosmopolitan city. There were Jews who were living there. There was a synagogue there. But there were many Gentile people from different backgrounds who were also living in the city. And these Christians came and for the first time began sharing the gospel with both Jew and Gentile. And the Gentiles were obedient to the gospel. And there the church merged these two diverse backgrounds. Well, word of that filters down to Jerusalem. They've heard the Gentiles have accepted the gospel. There has to be a question about how was this done? Uh, did they follow scripture? Were they baptized? How were they baptized? Who's leading this group? And so they send yeah, Barnabas. They send Barnabas up from Jerusalem 
to check on things in the city of Antioch. And it is there that he finds things in an incredible set of opportunities for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So if you'll turn your Bibles over just a couple of chapters to Acts chapter 11, we're going to pick up at verse 24. For he was a good man, and he was full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. A good man working with a perfect message in a city of opportunity, and the church was growing in Antioch. Verse 25, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. I don't know what kind of correspondence there may have been during these intervening years, but he certainly remembers him from the time that they had been together in Jerusalem. Well, that time that he introduced him to the church and that he likely was the, the one who was the conduit to get him to Caesarea and on up to Tarsus. So he travels about a hundred miles, maybe a little over depending on the roadway, from Antioch over to Tarsus. And there he has gone to get Saul to bring him back to be with the church and to work with the church in Antioch. And he found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year, they met with the church, they taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. We are introduced to an effective work. For a year, they and others, as we'll find in Acts 13, were laboring within that city, and the gospel was being spread, and there were many who were being converted and, and that little incidental note at the end of verse 26, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Christian is obviously a beautiful name, isn't it? What name would you and I rather be identified with than to be pe people who were like Christ or people who belong to Christ? Disciples of our Savior? Though initially that term likely was used somewhat der with some derision to make fun of individuals who were following that Christus guy, that guy. But they were called Christians first in Antioch. That became the, the title the, that by which they were recognized and identified by other, other individuals. Well, there's one other event that takes place in Antioch before we close out that scene of his early ministry. It says that at that time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them named Agabus. And he stood up and he began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a a great famine all over the world. This took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a, a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. And it get to the end of chapter 12, and it will mention that Barnabas and Paul return back to Antioch with John Mark with them. That will complete that journey. Sometimes people wonder of his uh, family that was going to be all over the world. Why were things going to be worse for the Christians in Jerusalem than, than Antioch or some other city? You do recall that when Jews made their break to Christianity, they renounced their, their Jewish heritage. And if they did not do so much of the renouncing, they were cut off by their, their Jewish families. Many of them lost their inheritances because they were disowned by their families. Many of them lost their jobs. Their careers were short and their jobs were became menial instead of things that had opportunities for advancement. And so when the famine came and there were food shortages, there may have been stores that wouldn't sell to them. There were outlets of food that were not going to be available. And this prophet of God, Agabus, is simply giving them advance notice. And so the church there decides to send to the church in Jerusalem aid. We're currently in our Sunday morning Bible class, our adult class, talking about the beauty of Christian fellowship. And one of the beauties of that fellowship is this broad spectrum, this broad scope that the fellowship in Christ offers us. It does offer us a family in a local setting like Old Hickory, but it also offers us this picture worldwide of those who are the disciples of Jesus Christ. 
When they heard this, they felt a, a commonality, a common desire to benefit those who were struggling somewhere else. And so they take up the contribution. They send it down at the hand of Paul and Barnabas, and they stay there a while, leave it, and then again at the end of chapter 12, they return back. Now, when they return back, it sets the stage for us in Acts 13 for what's going to be Paul's first missionary journey. And that will kind of be a part of next week's class as we think about Paul as the, the missionary. But there's one other event I want to tie into this story, and it actually takes place in, in sequence in Acts chapter 15, and it's going to take place after the first missionary journey. It's going to have to do with Paul and Barnabas again making a journey from Antioch to Jerusalem. And there they're going to meet with other apostles. They're going to meet with uh, the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And they're going to have to deal with what has become a very difficult situation. If you go to the text in Acts chapter 15, and a couple of verses will set for us what the doctrinal issue is about. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren there in Antioch, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, that's, that's a bold statement, isn't it? You have individuals who have traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch and given an opportunity whether to teach a class or preach a sermon, Here's the message that they have delivered to these Gentile converts in the city of Antioch. You cannot be saved unless you are circumcised. In a broader picture, and again, in, in all of our Bible classes, it seems like there's some common roads that we're traveling, but we just finished in Aubrey's class on 2 Corinthians and now in Galatians, this exact problem that's being addressed in different places it's not only an issue of circumcision. It's really an issue, are we going to bind the law of Moses on those individuals who are new converts to, to Christ? People who have come out of pagan background, and we talk about the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ and the beauty of grace and salvation as our sins are washed away when we're buried with him in, Christ, in baptism. Do they then need to arise from the waters of baptism and embrace the Mosaic law? Go to synagogue school? Uh, learn what all the binding Sabbath law restrictions were? Well, that becomes the real question. Those folks have come from Jerusalem to Antioch, and they're causing trouble in the church by saying that unless you are circumcised, you can't have salvation. And so uh, a group decide, let's send Paul and Barnabas down to Jerusalem and talk about it. I mean, these folks have come up saying, We've been sent by Jerusalem, though we find out later in the chapter that wasn't even true. But as the group begins to meet, we restate this issue in verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed, in other words, they were Christians. They were people who believed Jesus was the Son of God. He was the Messiah that had been promised. But they were still Pharisees, and they were hanging on much to the law. They were saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Well, Paul's going to say as he writes to the Galatians that when this message of error came regarding the Galatian churches, they did not give space to it even for a moment, not one hour. There was no debate as to whether this was a tenable position. It is in direct contradiction to the very grace and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And so they withstood that message. They challenged it. And as you turn to the story in, in Acts chapter 15, you have a set of witnesses. Peter stands up and he talks about what he remembers from the conversion of the household of Cornelius there in Acts chapter 10, how that he received a vision from the Lord sending him to this household and being taught that you don't call anything that God has created common or unclean, but that those of all nations who would respond in faith to Christ were accepted by him. And then you have Paul and Barnabas stand up and they begin telling the things that have happened to the Gentiles by this time, including the first missionary journey. 
but certainly now what is a multi-year history for the church that's been meeting in the city of, uh, of Antioch. And then James, the Lord's brother, stands up and I think speaks for the church there in Jerusalem. And he begins to reason from the scriptures how this is a momentous issue that has already been dealt with in the cross of Jesus. And so, again, just to condense Acts chapter 15, they decide that they're going to put no extra burden on on these new converts. They don't have to follow the law of Moses. There was nothing sinful, per se, about circumcision as a, as a physical right uh, or, or even as something that one might view as a family heritage. But requiring it for salvation, making it some kind of religious uh, plus or accommodation, no, Jesus was all sufficient. And he has some things that uh, in the letter that they write that are going to affect their behaviors and has to do with their, their morals. It has to do with distancing themselves from things that appear to be idolatrous so that uh, they don't aren't misleading in what it is that they're doing. Being free in Christ doesn't give us the freedom to go back and live like we were before we became Christians. And then at the hand of two representatives from Antioch and two representatives from Jerusalem, this letter is taken and read in all the Gentile churches, and it brings about great encouragement because they find out Jesus is all we need. I wonder when you and I became Christians, what is it that took place in those first years? You know, the Bible tells us that the first six years of a child's life, those formative years, are indeed the most crucial in, in their developing reading skills, in social skills, in their ability simply to develop intellectually. And I would think the same thing is, is true as it relates to their spiritual growth. Those first six years are very important in establishing a child's heart, values, and faith, relationship with God. But when we became Christians, what were those first few years like? Oftentimes, we become newborn babes in Christ, and we stay newborn babes in Christ for decades. As one individual said, it's a different thing in having 40 years experience or having one year's experience 40 times. And lots of times in our lives, we just simply fail to grow and to mature. Part of what we're called to be in Christ are babes that grow, new creatures that mature, servants that serve, and talents that we utilize in effective ways in the kingdom of God. Part of that is telling our story, telling the story of Jesus, being people who are evangelistic in our mindset because we have the greatest story in all the world to share. Again, part of it has to do with the way we function as members within a local congregation and the way we deepen our faith and our commitment on that broad basis of, to all those who are citizens of the kingdom of God. What were those first few years like? Were you challenged or did you just stagnate? Did you really grow and excel? Or maybe you grew and excel for a time, but that initial excitement and passion has kind of diminished. The light bulb's gone from 100 watts to 20 watts. It's not that it's out. It's not that we don't believe. It's not that we're not doing things. But if we talked about the transformation we see in the life of, of Saul of Tarsus and his passion it may not resemble exactly where we are. When I talk about times of conversion in our life, sometimes there is that new birth like Saul who was told to rise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's the new birth. But sometimes things happen in our lives. It can be a pandemic. It can be an illness. It can be a death. It can be a whole lot of things. It can be, actually be a Bible class on a Friday night that challenges us to realize I need to start over. I need to begin afresh. Not with a new birth, but with a recommitment. And so tonight as you... And I think just a bit about these early ministry years of Saul. May they be an encouragement to us to say, tonight, I want to recommit. I want to up the game. I want to get back in the game. I want to make my life 
a life lived for Jesus Christ. Father, we pray your blessing on every decision we make, but especially decisions we make to affirm and reaffirm our faith and determinations that we make in order to be more pleasing, to change those things that need to be changed, even in our lives as your children, that we might grow and be blessed in special ways by you. We ask those things tonight through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. Amen. I pray that you have a great week, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you next Friday evening at 7 o'clock, and we'll be looking at Paul the Missionary.